All right, welcome everybody. Um, some more people are gonna be jumping in as we go, uh, no doubt, but we wanna get started to respect everybody's time tonight. Um, we're very excited about our Tracing Your Bungalows materials tonight. This is a new, uh, we have a lot of seminars we do over and over again because you know they're really, really relevant and you guys like the reminders and we have new people constantly joining us, but um, we're really excited. Um, those of us who've seen the presentations a million times over from the Bungalow Association. <laughs> to have this like really interesting new topic. Um, just exploring, like doing a deep dive into where all of our materials come from that built all of these bungalows and other homes in the 1910s and 20s. Um, so uh, this is part one of a two part series. So uh, we're gonna have an additional one next week. Um, and these are the last two seminars for the fall series in general, just so you guys know. Uh, throughout the talk tonight, the way we're gonna run things, we're gonna let Sarah talk um, do her, her presentation and there's going to be, uh, you guys can put questions in the Q&A section. We've disabled the chat. Um, we just want to keep everything in Q&A and at the end of the presentation, I'll go and I'll sort of ask the questions and we'll get through them that way. But let's see, um, this is going to be recorded tonight. We're recording it right now. So we'll send it out to everybody who signed up as well. So uh, don't worry about frantically taking notes. We'll have all that available for you. And I think with that, I just want to introduce Sarah to everybody um, who uh, was sort of, you know, did a, helped us with a wonderful uh, series, a blog series that we did this year too that you might be familiar with. And we were so excited about it and everybody loved it so much that um, she was kind enough to do these as well for us. So uh, Sarah Dezember is currently pursuing her master's of architecture with an emphasis in interior architecture at the School of the Artist, Art Institute of Chicago. She's also pursuing a certificate in historic preservation and focuses her practices on uncovering the dichotomy between destruction and healing within the built environment. A California native, Sarah recently moved to Chicago with her husband and two cats, where she quickly learned about seasons and malort. So <laughs> welcome, Sarah. Thank you so, so much for doing this. Um, really excited to see your presentation and whenever you're ready, you can go ahead. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. And thank you for the introduction, Carla. Um, let me just get this set up. Okay, and you can see my screen all right? Yep. Can okay, see let me this. just yeah. go full yeah. screen mode. Yep. Um, awesome. I'm gonna hide myself for the rest of this, but I'll be here, so. Great. So hi everyone, thank you so much for joining tonight. Um, as Carla said, my name is Sarah Dezember and I am currently pursuing my Master's of Architecture with an emphasis in interior architecture and a certificate in historic preservation from SAIC, which is really just a long-winded way to say I'm interested in interior architecture and historic preservation. And so tonight I'm going to talk about some research that I've done that aim to uncover the origin stories of materials used in the construction of bungalows. And I just wanna quickly give a huge thanks to Carla who invited me to share my research because um, she's actually one of my professors too and sat in on um, the critique for my final project last semester that this research was based on. Um, and also thank you for Jillian for um, sorry, excuse me, Gillian for inviting me and coordinating tonight. Um, and also huge thank you to everyone at Chicago Bungalow Association. Um, so before we jump into things, I just wanna say that I am not an expert on bungalows or even an expert on materials for that matter. Uh, my background is actually in digital marketing. Um, I'm really just deeply interested in the power of storytelling. Um, so naturally, in my graduate studies, I've been fascinated about the stories our buildings have to tell us and trying to bring those stories to light. So in this presentation, I'm going to try to begin to start to unravel some of those hidden stories of our homes so that we can hopefully better understand them, um, better understand how to care for them and how to better preserve, preserve them for future generations. So specifically, um, tonight we'll talk about uh, brick and concrete, um, where those materials come from, how they're extracted, how they're processed, and how piece by piece uh, they become our homes. But as Carla mentioned, there's also part two to this research, which is happening next Thursday. Don't forget to RSVP, same place, same time. 
we're gonna be talking about plaster, wood, and even touch on water a little bit. So like I mentioned, this project actually started from a class that I took last semester called the Geological Atlas of Chicago, which really focused on understanding our built environment on a geological scale. So this image you see here is actually a collage that I created to try to start to understand where materials are coming from, what these various mining locations are, are look, they look like uh, kind of strung together um, as its own geo uh, geographical formation. Um, and in the class, really what we asked ourselves were simple, seemingly simple questions, I should say, um, like what materials were used to make this building? Where were those materials sourced from? How were those materials sourced? And even how are those materials processed, transported, and fabricated? And as you can imagine, those questions are actually really quite difficult to answer and, and really challenging to uncover. But really, that's what I'm trying to do in this research. So first, I want to talk about brick, because I think it's safe to say that brick is one of the most character-defining materials used in the construction of the Chicago bungalow. So bungalows, I'm sure as you all know, built in Chicago need something, a material that's naturally more insulated compared to West Coast counterparts, which are typically made of wood or stucco. And as we all know, the Chicago fire played such a large role in Chicago's history and really led us to rely on brick to rebuild our city because we needed something that was more fire resistant. So to first understand where bricks come from, I wanna first try to help understand what's a brick even made of. So sand typically takes up the largest percentage of material within brick at around 50 to 60% by weight. Um, specifically in this portion of the presentation, I wanna focus talking about clay. Um, I'll definitely touch on sand a bit more once we discuss concrete. Um, and you'll see here, clay takes up about 20 to 30% of brick. And of course there's iron oxide, magnesium and lime just at smaller percentages. So I really wanted to focus on clay specifically when discussing brick because Illinois has such a rich history when it comes to clay. And to understand that history, we first have to go back around 1.6 million years ago. I know it's hard to imagine, I know it was for me, but at one point, around 85% of Illinois was covered in glaciers that were roughly 3,000 feet thick or twice the height of Willis Tower. These glaciers shaped our current landscape and are the sole reason why Illinois' land is rich with clay. These glac glaciers are responsible for the bricks we have today and brick making industry that Chicago is known for. So what about these glaciers? As climates began to cool, glacial ice sheets in the Northern Hemisphere slowly began to spread outward, eventually covering Northern America. And Illinois' famously flat prairie landscape wasn't always flat. Those ice sheets actually moved and formed glaciers, which leveled hills and filled in valleys and eventually gave us the landscape that we know today. Fast forward, those glaciers began to melt. And when they melted, they deposited clay along what we know today as the Great Lakes and the Chicago River. It wasn't until about 1836 with the digging of the Illinois and Michigan Canal that it was discovered that Illinois soil was rich with clay. Shortly after, as you can imagine, clay pits surfaced all throughout Illinois and the state was on its way to making good use of this precious material. So then by 1915, 10% of all brick made in America was made here in Chicago. And so that discovery of clay not only catapulted Chicago forward as an industrial city and one of the fastest growing cities in the world, but more importantly, it gave us the Chicago brick. And in this image here, you'll see, start to make sense of where those glacial boundaries existed in relation to the bungalow belt. And as you can see, in relation to the bungalow belt also, there's quite a number of clay pits just within the surrounding area. 
Okay, so now that we know how the mineral clay produ is produced, I want to spend some time talking about how clay then becomes brick. And in order for us to make the brick used in the bungalow's brick walls, clay was dredged from either the bottom of Lake Michigan or Chicago River, like I mentioned, and then transported to nearby brickyards where it's processed. So once it was dredged and then brought to the brickyards, it was then ground and combined with a mixture of water and sand in order to be shaped. Then next, the brick was cut and set out to dry to remove any excess water. And this is really one of the main reasons why brick making and brick laying, especially in Chicago, is such a seasonal job. Temperatures had to be warm enough to allow the bricks to dry from the sun's warmth before they could even be fired. But once they were dried enough, they were then fired in a kiln at temperatures around 1500 to 1800 degree, degrees. And kilns were heated using coal and would sometimes burn for up to 24 hours at a time. So as I mentioned before, those glaciers were single-handedly responsible for creating a lucrative brick-making industry within Chicago. And during the height of Chicago brick production, there were over 60 million, or sorry, excuse me, 60 brick companies within Chicago that produced over 700 million bricks annually. Over the years, many small brickyards were purchased and con consolidated under a few larger companies. And Chicago brick production came to a halt when Congress passed the Clean Air Act in 1970, which actually required manufacturers to bring their kilns and processing facilities up to date to comply with new requirements. But rather than complying, the Illinois Brick Company, which was one of the remaining brick production companies in Chicago, decided to close. So, I mean, essentially in that light, we can start to argue that no true Chicago brick is, is being produced anymore. Okay, now that we know how clay is produced, we had some fun reminiscing about glaciers. We talked about how clay is extracted and tur is turned into brick. I want to talk about how that single brick starts to become your home. But first, it's important to note that before a single brick is laid on site for your home, a footing of reinforced concrete and even a basement has to first be constructed. But like I mentioned, we'll discuss that more when we get into talking about concrete. But what that means really is that there's a number of steps, not only in the brick making process, but in the construction process before the brick facade can even begin to take shape in your bungalow. So we actually also can't talk about brick without talking about mortar. Uh, mortar is what allows brick to bind together to create your bungalow's facade. So that means the production of mortar is just another critical step that's required before the brick exterior can even be laid. In the early 1900s, mortar was made with hydrated lime and sand. Again, there's that sand. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But we'll also talk about hydrated lime when we get into concrete. Um, limestone was first burned and then dissolved into water, which could take several days to fully dissolve before it was ready to be mixed with sand to then form the mortar. Once the mortar was ready, bricks were laid then by hand. And another thing that's interesting that came up in my research was not only trying to understand where materials are sourced from, but also who was sourcing those materials, who was actually manufacturing them. And as you can imagine, it's hard to know just how many hands it took to build your house. But with brick lane, it's always been a manual process. And the process itself has changed little to this day. And on average, a 1200 square foot bungalow could require around 12,000 bricks, which sounds like a lot. And it is a lot, but in relation to all the materials it takes to build your bungalow, brick actually probably makes up the smallest volume used in the construction process. So now that we know how clay's formed on a geological scale and a bit more about how it's discovered, extracted, manufactured, we can start to identify key characteristics found in the brick that will help us to identify where exactly your bungalow's brick 
originated from. So if your house was built between 1871 and 1981, it's highly likely that your house is made of Chicago brick. But because Chicago was also a national hub for trade, brick began to come from other parts of the Midwest that also had large amounts of clay in their soil like St. Louis and Milwaukee. And an easy way to tell is by examining the color of your bricks, your bungalow's brick. Chicago brick is high in limestone and iron, which gives it a salmony pink color. It also contains that glacial debris, which we talked about, which almost acts as a fingerprint, giving each brick a unique look. Milwaukee brick is known for its cream colored brick because of the clay that's rich with lime and sulfur. And clay from St. Louis has high levels of iron oxide, which attribute to that rich red brick. And I'm sure you are familiar with this image on the side um, of, of the different um, types of brick. These of course are the most commonly found brick, but of course there's tons of variations due to the chemical composition of clay, the conditions in which the brick were fired, how they've aged over time. So as you can see, it took quite literally millions of years to produce the brick required to build your bungalow's exterior. From the formation of prehistoric glaciers to the subsequent melting of those glaciers, the manufacturing of bricks was taking place long before humans intervened. Brick is often something that we see as a singular item, but in reality, it's actually reliant on many other minerals and materials. And as I mentioned before, brick can't be laid for your house without first building the foundation upon which it sits which is a nice little segue into our next material, concrete. So I followed a similar process with um, each material. So specifically with concrete, trying to understand where was the concrete that's used in your bungalow coming from. But first I just wanna see if you can name, no need to unmute yourself. You can just jot down some notes, maybe answer in your head. I just wanna see if you can start to think of all the places that concrete is used in your house. And I also did give a clue, so hopefully you were listening. <laughs> okay, maybe you first thought front steps. Yes, that is correct. You are a winner. Maybe you said it's used in my foundation. Yep, you are also correct. Maybe you said, well, Sarah, it's used in my basement. Yes, you are also correct. Everyone is a winner there's probably even more applications of concrete used in your bungalow. But I really just wanted to focus on these three for a reason. I think it's really telling um, and interesting that you can see quite quickly what a vital role play concrete plays in your bungalow. It's how you get to your house. It's what holds your house up. It's what protects your house from things like flooding. Concrete is essentially the backbone of your home. So now let's try to talk about it. What is concrete? So concrete is made of four basic components. It's made of aggregate, water, cement, and air, which means concrete doesn't come from one place. Each ingredient is sourced from a different location and even composed of different materials itself. Each of these is then brought together and combined to make concrete. So following that same logic of trying to uncover, you know, the, the origin of each of these materials, you see that the seemingly simple formula of concrete becomes a lot more complex when we try to identify where each of its elements are from. So next I'm gonna start digging deeper into each component. And first I'm gonna talk about aggregate because it does typically make up um, the largest percentage of concrete, it typically makes up around 60 to 80%. An aggregate can be composed of anything like sand, gravel, limestone, or some other crushed stone, which is then combined with cement and water to make concrete. So as you can see, like I mentioned, we start to unravel the complexities of concrete with just this first ing ingredient, aggregate. Since it can be made of so many different things, it's really difficult to pin down exactly, first of all, which aggregate was used in your concrete, Secondly, where is that aggregate being sourced from? So in the next few slides, I'm gonna to touch on each of these potential ingredients, sand, gravel, and limestone. 
So sand and gravel resources are usually mined from floodplains, shorelines, or sand dunes. Sand forms when rock breaks down from weathering, which most often occurs from wind or water. Like clay, which we discussed earlier, river channels and glacial deposits provide for the richest amount of sand and gravel production. And as we saw in brick production, that sand makes the largest percent of, of brick, it also plays a large role in construction overall. Um, in fact, sand, which we don't often associate with the material related to the construction of our homes, is actually one of the world's largest mining endeavors. And the states leading in sand mining in ascending order are Wisconsin, Illinois, Texas, Minnesota, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Iowa. Sand and gravel are most commonly mined in open pits, which you see in the picture here. The mining starts by removing the topsoil, which is sorted, washed, dried, and then transported out of the mine. The remaining materials are then used to backfill the soil. So to help us to start understanding where all the sand is coming from, I created this map that locates sand mining pits in the region, in, again, in relation to that bungalow belt to try to help us to start contextualizing where these materials are coming from. And I mean, let's face it, sand used in both brick and concrete in your bungalow could be coming from anywhere and was likely dictated by the contractor or even the developer. But as you can see here, there's actually quite a few sand pits not far from the bungalow belt. So we can likely assume that it could potentially be coming from any of these locations. And as you can see, I made a similar graphic here with rock quarries in the area. And there's a lot more, <laughs> but um, it, it, rock is, a, a, as you can imagine, an extremely affordable resource. Um, and really what I think is helpful here is, you know, I think we're very far removed from um, mineral extraction process in the first place. And I wanted to try to start to see just how much landscape that these spaces occupy, which I think can be really quite powerful. Next, I'm gonna talk about aggregates. Um, aggregates are often made from limestone, or sorry, aggregates are often made from limestone as well, especially in Illinois, um, because Illinois has such an abundance of limestone. And a quick history lesson will teach us why about 425 million years ago before Illinois was pushed north by tectonics, it was covered in a shallow tropic sea. At the base of this ancient sea was rich and diverse coral reef. That coral reef took in seawater and processed out the lime, creating lime deposits that would harden and then produce limestone. So again, here's a similar map that starts to um, help us understand where these limestone quarries were mined um, and located. And I'm sure you might be familiar with Thornton Quarry, which is <clears throat> one of the world's largest limestone quarries. And it's only about a 40 minute drive south from downtown Chicago. Uh, limestone is typically extracted through a blast or a mechanical extraction, depending on the hardness of the stone. Once it's removed, it's then crushed on site and transported to the man manufacturing site to be further processed. In addition to aggregate, concrete production also requires cement. And cement is a fine powder made of crushed materials such as limestone, which we just talked about, and our friend that we met earlier, clay. When mixed with water in aggregates, cement acts as a binding element that helps concrete to harden. Um, and I wanted to include this diagram because really, I mean, this, the research that I'm doing is trying to expose just this and think about if we can really imagine this type of diagram for all of the materials that we've talked about strung into one kind of long timeline that really help us to contextualize just how much um, energy is expended to create the materials that are used in the construction of our homes. 
And I think it's especially powerful with cement because it really only makes up 10% of concrete. And you can see just how many steps go into the process to even produce cement alone. So where did cement come from for your house? In 1915, there were five major cement plants in Illinois. Today, there are three. Uh, cement is expensive to transport because it's costly and it's likely to dry out and crack if it's traveling long distances. So that means the cement for your bungalow likely came from one of these plants. Although it is important to note that one of the largest cement plants in the world is located in Michigan, and because Michigan is also home to many limestone quarries, we can assume that this cement producer often sourced its aggregate from nearby quarries to cut down on transportation costs. And so the last two materials I wanna talk about today are air and water. Air and water are both really elusive components to talk about in relation to building materials, but they're actually really crucial in many steps and in many materials. But for this reason, they're often overlooked and these two are especially important in the production of concrete. Water is needed to hydrate cement in order to make it workable and air helps to make sure that the water can move and escape. If there's too much water in your concrete, your water will freeze and expand, which leads to cracking. So again, what we see as a simple step that you use to get into your home or a wall or a foundation, it really begins to unravel into this complex story about geology, mineral, mineral extraction, material composition, transportation, manufacturing, and more. Concrete is not a singular item or even a material for that matter. And that's really the main point I'm trying to uncover from this research. Every day we're surrounded by our homes that we can often take for granted. Each brick, each pour of concrete took millions of years to produce. They've often traveled miles, gone through massive transformations, and then put together piece by piece to create the places we're lucky enough to call home. So like I mentioned and Carla mentioned, we do have a part two. Um, this is all I have for you today about brick and concrete. And I wanna thank you again for uh, having me and allowing me to, to nerd out about uh, the geological scale of our homes. Um, and I wanna again, thank the Chicago Bungalow Association for inviting me to share this research with you. Like I mentioned, part two, same time, same place, next Thursday, 6 p.m., we'll talk about wood, plaster, and water. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. That was so interesting. Um, yeah, you know, we take all of these things for, for granted, and it's like, it's incredible when you think about, like, geologic time. And <laughs> yeah, that was really what was kind of the most eye-opening for me in this research was to think about a time period that you really have a hard time cont contextualizing in the relation to the spaces that we exist in every day. Yeah, and also when we think about, you know, we really try to focus on uh, vintage architecture, you know, in part because, you know, to destroy these buildings, of course, is to, you know, and throw everything away. And it's like, when you have this kind of context, it's like, what are we throwing away? That's insane, you know, right. it's completely nuts. Um, uh, we do have a few questions too, I just wanted to get to. Um, uh, so Jeffrey asked, um, he was curious, wasn't clay also from land pits? Um, you mentioned lakes and rivers and there's so much clay that's close to the surface around Chicago. Mm -hmm. So can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I didn't cover land pits too much in my research, um, but yes, it's definitely a place that clay can be sourced from. Um, specifically, I focused and, and kind of was, the research felt so big that I think there's just so much I'm sure that I did not include, but I specifically was trying to focus in on Chicago River itself um, because I, for my project specifically, I was focused on the digging of the Illinois Canal. So I was trying to really have a conversation about those two things, but yes, definitely land pits are another place for clay. And I think that's what also is telling in that map to see where all the clay pit locations were in Illinois. You know, obviously there were some not by a river and not by the lake. 
<laughs> totally. And so interesting too, how we can see like the color variation in the clay based on the properties of the clay. I remember learning like, you see like those little dark spots and bricks too. It's like, oh, there must be a high iron content in the clay. It's mm -hmm. like rust coming out of, you know, that we see in the brick too. It's, so you can actually tell so much um, walking around above ground about what's below ground, you know, when you know yeah. what you're looking for. Um, so cool. Uh, <laughs> um, there's a couple here that are a little bit, um, I'm happy to sort of chime in on too, uh, mm -hmm. unless you want to take them, Sarah. I'm not sure how deep you've gotten into the mortar world yet um, mm -hmm. in your studies. <laughs> um, but uh, Lisa asked this question, do you know about different types of mortar? I have brick that gets dusty. I was told that's the wrong kind of mortar used. So I guess yes, I might need to tap out on this one. I'm just in, um, <laughs> I'm in a historic materials class this semester where we did talk about mortar and I should be able to um, answer this one a little bit more quickly, but I'd probably feel more confident if I was looking at my notes to be able to tell you about each different type of mortar. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, I can answer and sort of, um, and Lisa, I hope, hopefully you're still on. We have, um, we actually did a whole video series on um, historic brick that we have on our Facebook page and also on our, our website at chicagobungalow.org. Um, so you can check that out. We super geek out on, uh, on mortar on, in that, but uh, just to give sort of a general short answer on it, um, we also do uh, presentations like, like the one we're doing tonight on that. So, um, so uh, older brick is, is softer. Basically, we didn't uh, fire them in the same way that we do today. Um, the properties are a little uh, different. And uh, so because it's a softer brick, uh, we need a softer mortar for it because the mortar is supposed to be the, the sacrificial element of a wall. So if the mortar is sort of more porous and soft, then when your wall gets wet from rain and whatever, um, then uh, it will, all of the water will evaporate through the mortar. If the mortar is too hard and the brick is softer, then the water will stay where it's softer and more porous, right? So when you have all this water trapped in your brick, then it slowly, slowly evaporates out of the brick instead of quickly evaporating out of a mortar. Um, so when that happens, all the minerals and stuff that uh, Sarah mentioned earlier um, are sort of, sort of gravitate, like shoved to the surface of the brick and you get that powder. It's not the end of the world, it's called efflorescence. It's not the end of the world, um, but it's, it's symptomatic. It's showing you that something's wrong. Um, so you have too hard of a mortar. You probably have like a, a type O or N mortar, most likely um, has a little bit too much, too much Portland cement. You should have more, uh, more lime in your mortar, basically. Um, it's not that hard to get it, but for some reason in Chicago, Mason's just always, there's this mentality of like newer is better, harder, stronger, better. Um, they're wrong. <laughs> and you know, it's a conversation you just have to have a lot. Um, we have tons of information about that, but, um, but that's what that is, that white powdery stuff. Um, it's really, really common, so it's not like the end of the world, but um, really what should be done is that mortar should be removed um, and, a, and a softer mortar should be put in there, unfortunately. Um, so keep an eye on it. Uh, sometimes it can get really bad and then something really does need to be done about that. Once your brick is, um, gets, uh, there are crystals that it will expand uh, under your brick and then it becomes subfluorescence where it'll actually push the, the face of your brick off. Um, and there's like an enamel, like, like I say, a brick is like a tooth and you know, it's got like an enamel to it. And so um, when those crystals get too big, um, then it can actually destroy the brick. Cause just like with your tooth, your tooth is no good if you don't have enamel on it, right? So um, anyway, keep an eye on it, but um, that's a common problem. Uh, okay, and all right, how do I sign up for, we got a part two already wants to sign up, Sarah, that's very good. All right, <laughs> we'll, roll, we'll give you the VIP treatment for signing yeah, up. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jeffrey's just commenting, like the material, it's taking a million years for me to repair some of it. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> understand that. Um, uh, yes, uh, Mary Kay, uh, mortar should have, for older brick, older brick, newer brick, um, harder mortar is okay because the brick is harder, right? So for older, but for older vintage brick, if you've got, you know, something built 1910s or 20s, even up through like 40s, um, you're gonna definitely want a little bit of a softer mortar. Um, so that is correct. Um, what type of concrete is used for the steps? Do you know how to differentiate that, Sarah? I don't actually, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. 
I don't even know. I, yeah, I don't know if I would know. I mean, I it's safe to say it's poured concrete as opposed to cast in place, but I think anything beyond that, it would be really difficult to identify. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure about that one either. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, sorry, a lot of these are coming in all at once. So I had my I had a grip yeah. on it all, and then. <laughs> And I think especially with concrete, since it is, uh, I mean, since cement, I think kind of gives it more of a, I don't want to say not organic, because I mean, a lot of the other materials we're looking at are all organic materials, but I think cement has kind of a property that makes it more manufactured, if that makes sense. So I think it kind of is harder to identify any of those like what type of aggregates are used? Because I think the cement kind of masks a lot of that. Yeah, um, but in, to that point, um, you can't, yeah, in terms of getting really specific with aggregate, and hopefully you all know, I uh, can't remember if you specifically said what aggregate is, but it's all the little like stones that are mixed with cement to create concrete. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, somebody asked on here if the details are the exterior stone details of my, of, of my bungalow, are they made of concrete? Um, and the trick to know if it's concrete or limestone, it's probably limestone. This is from Byron. Uh, Byron, it's probably limestone. It usually is with bungalows, but um, to make sure if you look real closely at it, um, if there's little pebbles in it mm -hmm. of aggregate, that means that it's, it's concrete. Um, so that's, that's a sneaky trick. Um, and essentially in limes, if it was limestone too, if you're also looking really closely, you should be able to see some of that organic material like shells or, um, I mean, I would imagine it might be a little bit more difficult to pin that out than a pebble, but. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Although interestingly, if you're down, um, if you're in coastal areas, they use shells for aggregate. So you'll mm -hmm. see big shells instead of stones, um, which I think is really cool. Um, let's see. Uh, Okay, that has to be. Um, yeah, Mary Kay, just to, uh, you'd asked also about mortar. Definitely check out the video series that we did online about all of the mortar. It's, it's really in depth. There's, uh, I think we did three videos just on repointing your wall where we, we get super, super into it all and explain everything. Um, um, and yeah, I'm not sure about this one either. And you, you may not either. I know that you're more looking at sort of where these things came from in the first place, Sarah, but. Um, I know, I know what Margaret, Margaret is asking, what is your take on the grayish, seemingly inferior concrete that is being poured these days? Um, when seeing the older stamps on sidewalks with their respective dates, it's amazing that they survived and are better quality than currently poured sidewalks. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I can touch on that a lot, but I think it's just a testament to a lot of materials now. Like we just try to add more additives to them to make them more stable. And that tends to take away a lot of the beauty, I guess, the organic kind of components of what they're actually made of. Um, and I, I feel like, I don't know if that really answers the question, but it does, I think in terms of when we're thinking about concrete, it just kind of takes away all the character because we're just trying to make things, like you said, that are harder, stronger, but, for yeah. what reason? There was um, Route 66, um, they did a National Register nomination for that where they had Portland cement, um, I guess that it was all Portland cement that was used for Route 66 in the original one, and it held up amazingly well. Like Portland cement is not what you want for your, to mm -hmm. you don't want to repoint your wall with that if it's old brick, but it is incredibly durable apparently, and I know very little again about this, but um, um, as a road. So <laughs> it held up beautifully. Um, so yeah, I, that grayish stuff and, and oftentimes on steps, you know, they'll sort of smear it over the top, like a skim coat of it and it doesn't tend to hold up very well. Um, so yeah, additives would make sense. Um, okay. Um, yes. Uh, Okay, most of these are, are sort of brick questions um, that are about water being trapped in walls, I can tell you right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll take a couple of these if you don't mind hanging with us. Uh, yeah, no problem. Because um, we might get more questions in too that I absolutely could not answer. Um, 
Uh, but first, uh, you know, Jeffrey also made the point uh, that there there is a lot of fuel also needed to create cement. So we talked about mm -hmm. some other ways that it was. Um, yeah, and actually for this class that I um, took last semester, the way that it was structured is we first looked at a single material. So I first researched concrete and then we were ident or assigned or we picked a specific um, housing type in Chicago to explore. So I picked concrete and then picked the bungalow. Um, and so, yeah, that was really what, um, and I'm happy to share my presentation with you for um, what I put together for cement, but it does talk about just how um, much energy and especially cement within the process, how much uh, fuel it takes to burn cement to be able to, um, or burn all the materials needed to turn it into cement. Mm -hmm. um, okay, then I will tackle a couple of these other ones. It'll be good for you to hear it anyway, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> Learning about it in class. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yes, yeah, softer mortar, more lime. Um, okay, when you see that efflorescence on the inside of your building, um, do you then just need the tuck pointing on the interior of the building? Um, this is from Katie. Katie, oftentimes, you, if you're maybe talking about in your basement is where it's pretty common, where you'll see it, um, especially in the upper part of the wall in your basement. Um, a lot of times that means that there's water coming in um, it's infiltrating to the side of your building from outside. This could be because you have a downspout that's um, ejecting water along your building. Um, oftentimes, especially if it's a bungalow, um, but, you know, we have these tight lots and you have this uh, a walkway, you know, the gangway between the two bungalows and you kind of have like one lucky person and one unlucky person, you know, depending on which way that that gangway is tipping because it's usually tipping one way or the other, right? Um, so that water can run into the side of your building and then you'll see in your basement walls, you'll see this um, uh, efflorescence that's happening. Um, you know, the first thing always to do is to figure out, you know, become friends with your neighbor um, and then see if there's some way you guys can work out an agreement for something like maybe a French drain to go between your homes uh, or, uh, you know, some, some way to just sort of make sure that the water is going away. You know, it's not a great thing to have your downspout tied into the sewer system in general, the, because we have a combined sewer system here. But uh, I have to say, when you kind of look at, you know, the, the length of a bungalow, you know, 125 feet or something, you know, down, and there's no land for that water to eject into, um, you know, so sometimes people are tied into the sewer system directly along the side there, um, which would help take some of that water away. Uh, you know, otherwise you just want to try and get your downspot as far away as possible and make sure water's not tipping into your building. Another thing is if you're landscaping, um, you know, here's your wall. This is so awkward. Um, <laughs> and if the landscaping eventually over time it erodes against your wall, you want to build that back up. So it's just over your foundation line so that it slopes away. You just want to keep the water away from your house, away from your house. Um, once you deal with how the water is getting into that wall, you can then um, go in your basement, uh, repoint it, especially if, you're, and if your wall is painted in the basement, that's, that's going to be trapping more water in. I know we, we want it to be pretty, um, but you know, the exposed wall is in, so that's all right. You know, um, it's been in for a while. I don't think it's going away anytime soon because everybody's crazy about warehouse buildings still. Um, so, you know, th that's going to be part of what's trapping it in there and you might just need to repoint uh, the mortar as well if you have a hard, too hard of a mortar or something in there. Um, uh, yes, so, okay, I got that, um, yep, um, yes, it can take more time and expertise with lime mortar, um, but it is worth it because you could really lose your whole wall, otherwise <laughs> you're going to have to repoint, I mean, you could have real problems, and once that break is, is you know, once that, um, Break is compromised, you have to replace it, which is a real pain. Um, so, okay. Um, okay, answered that one. Cruising here. Um, yep, talked about that. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, somebody asked about sealing brick. Um, no, do not seal your brick if it's old brick, never. Never seal it. Um, even uh, even some newer brick I've seen. Um, don't do it. 
it's it's absolutely the worst thing you can do because you're trapping water into your wall. What you you really need that water to escape your wall. You need it to be able to leave your wall. Um, that's just how the material works. It's just um, it's kind of building materials 101. So I'm not quite sure why there's still so much argument because every time it's a bad idea. <laughs> so so I, I I would absolutely advise against that. Um, but I know people advise, so it's not your fault. They should know better. Um, okay. Brick on the front porch, brick on the front and porch has a smooth face. How did that happen? Yeah, um, I saw this one and I was curious. I mean, I don't know for certain. I had a hunch that it could be related to weathering, but. Well, I I'm wondering know. if it, it might have something to do with um, uh, if it's common brick versus face brick. So it might be uh, the maybe it's um, so some face brick is fired at a higher a hotter temperature it can be fired it's, you know so it's almost um, almost like glassy a little bit you know and and so they don't so with a bungalow for example and a lot of other architectural types you'll you'll have a different kind of brick sometimes it's slightly shiny um, around the front of your building and then it just extends a little bit back into your sidewalls um, and that's called face brick. And that's, that's like fancy brick, you know? And the idea, the reason it doesn't wrap all the way down the sides of, of the home, your homes or, or buildings in general, so the idea is like you're walking down the street, you see just enough. So as you're walking down the street, it all looks like face brick, right? But if you go down the, the gangway a little bit, then you'll realize it's common brick. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's very intentionally just a different kind of brick to make everything look a little fancier, um, honestly. And, and they do just fire it a bit differently that way and usually have a more uniform color or they'll stamp it or do something to make it uh, look different. You know, you have 80,000 bungalows in Chicago, for example, you know, those little patterns, you know, raked brick or the, they would change the colors. So house to house, you know, one is yellow, one is red, one is brown, you know, um, all that's just to make people feel sort of like they have this unique, you know, home that's all their own. And they've done this everywhere. I mean, they do this in like, you know, Euro European cities like, uh, you know, like Copenhagen, where you have all of these sort of, you know, buildings that are tall and narrow and, you know, connected with party walls. And still there's a differentiation between them because everybody kind of wants to feel like this is my unique space, right? Um, yeah, good, good question. Um, yep, my bungalow has two types of brick that I can see. Um, that, that's, I'm sure, what you mean by uh, the, the common brick versus um, the face brick. Thank you, Don. Don says we did nice work. <laughs> Thanks, Don. <laughs> um, all right. Um, yes, that was answered about the interior. Um, Mary Kay is all about mortar. Great. Um, yeah, and I really do encourage you all to go to our website once again and, and look at those videos. Um, they are really, really detailed. Okay, I think we got all of the questions. If there's um, doesn't look like there's anything else. Thank you as well, Emma. <laughs> Hopefully we'll see you at the next session. Um, Sarah, thank you so much. This was so great. Um, really, really interesting. Nobody ever, um, uh, you know, talks about these things really. These like early, you know, like the real nitty gritty getting underground and archaeological yeah. about it even. And um, it's, it's definitely hard research to do. I mean, it doesn't, these answers like I, I did this research and I didn't even really give you answers I still can't really tell you exactly <laughs> the mine that the sand was mined for to use in the construction of your clay it's just so hard to really know that but I think really like you said the work is to try to start asking ourselves these questions to try to start being more mindful and recognize the amount of energy that goes into creating the spaces that we inhabit so we can just better care for them yeah, and yeah, and appreciate them in general, just like, yeah. you know, it took how many millions of years to create this, you know, yeah. moving stone, you know, that's crazy, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so great, so interesting. Um, thanks to everybody who joined us tonight on Facebook and on Zoom. Um, lovely to have you here, glad there's so much interest in this, and really excited um, to come back next week to talk about more materials. So can you um, write wood plaster in water? So come back for part two, more good stuff to come, um, and have a great night, everybody. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks again, Sarah.